agenda is a presentation from Jennifer Brown, uh, the West Virginia Director of Senior and Community Services. And uh, she's going to discuss uh, challenges of providing senior care during the pandemic. Hello. Ms. Brown, as it's custom of this committee, we do need to swear you in. Sure. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. You may proceed. Um, and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity today. And I promise I'll keep it brief. I know it's a Sunday afternoon and you don't want to stay all day in our meeting. Uh, but good afternoon, I am Jennifer Brown, Executive Director of Council on Aging and All Care Home and Community Services. We manage senior programs in Wyoming County and additional areas, but also represent the senior service providers across the state as president of the association, West Virginia Directors of Senior and Community Services. I'm here today to reinforce the relationships and the partnerships that we have with the state of West Virginia and its agencies to make you aware of our interests in assessing our state senior population and services it needs. Our association, aware of the effect the COVID pandemic has had on our senior citizen, our member agencies, has asked the West Virginia University Bureau of Business and Economic Research to gather information about the needs of the elderly and the services our members provide. We know that the pandemic changed our communities and we are committed to better understand the needs today of the elderly service residents we serve. I'll provide more information about that important project in just a few minutes. But first allow me to update our story and tell you who we are, what we do, and what we mean to our communities. Most of our senior service providers, well established and trusted in our communities, have been in operation for more than 50 years. They are private nonprofit agencies that emerged after the passage in 1965 of the Federal Older Americans Act. The Older Americans Act, known as the OAA, has been the foundation upon which federal, state, and local organizations have developed, planned, and delivered home and community-based services and support to older adults and their caregivers. The goal in the 1960s was to help older Americans live in their homes and communities with dignity and independence for as long as possible. That remains our goal today. We believe our programs are the most cost-effective means to accomplish our important mission to enhance the quality of life of senior citizens. Over time, West Virginia senior agencies adapted and grew to meet the specific needs of the elderly on a local level. Providing ongoing care, nutrition, support, and senior citizens' own homes through myriad programs. Member agencies now provide services to more than 30,000 West Virginia seniors, most of whom are low income, and employ more than 3,000 individuals across the state. We are important to senior citizens, their families, and the economy of West Virginia communities. We enable senior citizens to remain in their homes rather than depend on long-term care facilities that provides enormous savings to government. Each senior services provider is unique. Each runs as a business that is answerable to a local board that includes local professionals and residents. We abide by the rules that affect our delivery services and funding, and we are committed to delivering services in the most efficient way. Our nutrition programs address the dietary needs of our aging clients who tend to experience changes in their metabolism. The nutrition services our agencies provide through home delivered meals or the meals that we serve at the sites help avoid complicated and dangerous health problems. While our nutrition services are critical to tens of thousands of West Virginians, we also provide our seniors social activities that enhance their quality of life. They can participate in group activities, learn new skills, and enjoy the fellowship of those with similar interests. Our senior service providers promote independence, good health, and overall well being, and help our clients avoid isolation, depression, and loneliness. We provide much more than meals and senior and social activities, however. Local senior center agencies may be able to help res res elderly residents with transportation to medical appointments, the grocery store, bank, pharmacy, and other essential destinations. Transportation is critical to seniors, including those who live in lightly populated remote areas of the state. Some of our association members are prepared to transport clients from their homes in Southern West Virginia to medical specialists in Charleston or Morgantown. 
That service is an economical alternative to relying on a private ambulance for transportation. Our agency's experienced caregivers provide in-home assistance to individuals who have mental and or physical impairments. Those tasks include bathing, general grooming, dressing, and light housekeeping as deemed necessary by their physicians. We have special programs that provide in-home care for individuals who have served in all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces and want to remain in their homes rather than move to extended care facilities. We offer a respite program to those who care for high demand, frail, and ill family members. The program offers well-deserved breaks to caregivers and allows them to tend for other responsibilities and enjoy some personal time. Similarly, our Alzheimer's Dementia Respite Program provides relief services for caregivers of family members with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Trained personnel provide standard care with a focus on safety, activities, and companionship. Our members also provide seniors with the best available information about the services available to them in their communities, such as assistive technology. We inform them about existing services and benefits that they may not be aware of. As I mentioned, our services allow many clients to remain in their residences rather than in their nursing homes. Senior citizens who remain in their homes are more comfortable. They enjoy a better quality of life. It's that simple. Furthermore, such an approach is a far more cost effective. That is the sampling of the kinds of services our members provide to their clients. Our senior service providers are closely aligned with the communities they serve. Our clients are our neighbors. Our clients, we know them, they know us. We speak with their loved ones, we hold seniors' hands, we share their pain, we hear their dreams. Most of you are aware that many West Virginians have moved to other states to earn a living, leaving behind elderly parents and other relatives. Those aging citizens may have few, if other, nearby to help them. That is where senior service providers are making a difference. We are fortunate to have so many capable, caring employees working for our senior service providers. They go to great lengths to know and assist our seniors by delivering meals and providing care in clients' homes. We are waging a war on isolation and loneliness. We boost our clients' health by serving nutritional meals and providing access to health care providers, pharmacies, and grocery stores. It is truly painful when the demand for services exceeds our, our ability to deliver. I'd like to take a pause here, if I could, just to show you a video that the Registered Herald had did about some of the services we provide. I go out in all kind of weather. There's days when it's, when I'm drenched from the top down to my knees. <laughs> Jennifer said that we were the only county that goes out as far as we do, like Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I put around 119 miles a day on, on this truck. Some of our people have cancer. Some of them have just uh, got their, their partner, their husband or wife is not able to do anything anymore like because of maybe dementia. They need the meals because they're not able to do anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, he's a good boy though, ain't you? Good morning, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. I don't cook because of the vertigo. The last time I boiled water, it uh, burned the pot. The uh, Meals on Wheels about a year and a half. Yeah, the reason I had a stroke, and it took me a year to get back on my feet. I can see my hands. I'm getting arthritis so bad. Sometimes I can't even lift with them or anything. Well, I ha I've had to go in before and and stop a lady's bathroom. I had to go get a cat out of a tree, and and then sometimes they just want to talk. Sometimes they haven't seen people for probably days other than me. Well, no, Bernie had one. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't actually pay none? No. I found one that was passed away. I went to 
went down by her house and the door was open. I went down and turned and came back and uh, she was laying on the inside of the door. I knew she was dead, you know, when I got there. I'm concerned about the people who are on the waiting list to get the meals. We don't have the funds to add any more on right now. August will be 12 years. I make minimum wage, but I keep the job because I like my people. I, I know I would miss them and they would miss me, so I just stay because of that. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> Um, just leaving a little bit more personal note to the video. Um, you know, I, I think they did a great job with that because not only shows the, you know, the vulnerable people we serve, but the, the staff that we have, it really cares. And uh, the lady in that video has passed away, the, our staff person. So we're, we're sad that we've, we've lost her, but she's one of the great staff that's, that's dedicated her life to helping people like that. Um, while senior agencies are nonprofit organizations, they operate as businesses. Just as vulnerable to the pandemic, workforce challenges, and inflation that affected employers across the state, food and gasoline costs more, much more. Insurance costs more, utilities cost more. Just as local restaurants and grocery stores struggle to attract and retain employees, our member agencies cope with the same trends. Our agencies must be nimble and creative in responding to those challenges while making sure we comply with government regulations that affect the delivery of services and the financial support we require. Our experiences have taught us that we can expect to experience change and we must prepare to manage it. Collectively, our members constitute a strong economic engine with various programs bringing in more than $100 million annually into West Virginia. We receive state and federal dollars, but most of our funding comes from fee-for-service transaction and other private sources. That large investment in senior services does not mean our members are without financial challenges. Our members are often asked to do more while revenue streams are not keeping the pace. The Lighthouse program is an example. It is designed to assist seniors who have functional needs in their homes, but whose income or assets disqualify them from Medicaid services. Available in each county, the Lighthouse program provides support in four areas, personal care, mobility, nutrition, and environmental. The primary funding comes from the upfront licensing fees the state's racetracks pay for the privilege of offering table games. Each county receives a percentage of the funding based on a formula the Bureau of Senior Services has developed. We have seen extremely limited reimbursement increases since the program's inception in 2007. With the occurrence of COVID and less financial certainty, our member agencies are working to better understand our clients and their needs and how we can best serve them. While state code tasks the Bureau of Senior Services to assess the needs of our state's elderly, our association has taken on a project with Dr. John Deskins of the West Virginia University Bureau of Business and Economic Research to survey our seniors about their needs and the services our members provide. COVID-related funding has helped our agencies and of course many West Virginia businesses, but we know we will have to operate with increased costs that will outlast COVID-related government funding during our spring conference, the Bureau of Senior Services reported they will need additional $5 million or $6 million to continue nutrition services at the current level. The Bureau has not requested that funding, and we're working to meet that challenge. Now that COVID has affected all aspects of society, we want to have a more thorough understanding of what services seniors currently need to live at home and in their communities with dignity and independence. We want to understand how senior services providers can best assist the elderly. We want to know the economic effect that those services have in West Virginia. We will survey senior citizens across the state and senior services providers who assist them. To support this project, we have contacted the West Virginia Bureau of Senior Services and the West Virginia Bureau of Medical Services, requesting five years of data regarding the services we provide. We see our members and those agencies that have the same goals, the care and well-being of our elderly in the state. We are waiting for responses from those agencies 
and hope we will not experience delays that would inhibit the completion of this project. We believe fresh information from Dr. Deskins will give, give us a clear picture of the needs of our senior citizens and the amount of support we need to deliver those services. Our goal is to complete the project by December when we hope Dr. Deskins will be able to give a formal presentation of his findings. Today, West Virginians are aware that government can be a partner or occasionally a detriment to community-based services organizations. We want simply to continue to care for our seniors in the best and most efficient ways possible. We want to be free from erroneous and needless government regulation. While funding will always be critical for members serving the elderly, we are not here today to request additional monies. We believe the legislature has been mindful of the needs of the seniors and responsive, and we're grateful for the funds the West Virginia Lottery has provided. We have encountered perplexing situations while per trying to provide services. There are unspent funds in the Bureau's budget at the end of the state fiscal year that's not reallocated. We don't understand why the Bureau of Senior Services has to return these funds earmarked to seniors to state coffers when so many of our members struggle with their budgets. The Bureau has some grant requirements that make it difficult for our members to obtain funding to use as they need. At a time when private businesses and government agencies struggle with funding, we need support from the Bureau. Our senior service providers communicate with one another, encourage the use of best practices. Our members are united in their commitment to provide life-enhancing services to senior citizens in a compassionate and professional manner. We recognize that any missteps on our part would impair our ability to serve senior citizens, and that's not acceptable. We work each day to prepare the care, the meals, respect, and hope that each human being requires. We want the members of the legislature to be aware of our mission and our aspirations for the future. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And uh, do any of the members of the committee have any questions for our presenter? Delegate Nelson, or uh, Senator Nelson, on back to the old days. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jennifer, thank you for the uh, presentation and um, quite moving, uh, I guess, when you see some of the film. Let's get to the financial side of things. Okay. You. Uh, how about updating the committee what your annual budget is? Annual budget for uh, for my agency? The, yeah, that, that comes in from lottery. Um, if it comes in from the lottery directly from my agency is probably only a, I think I calculated it's like 70% of my budget. And so it's a, I would say it's about $300,000 for my agency. Okay. But, but that for statewide, I, I don't know what the number is statewide. We have, let's see, I don't think I brought the, the bureau's budget no. I'm sorry. Okay, no. probably be good to get an update if you don't mind, but what, uh, sure. I guess what um, hit me was the comment you made of uh, uh, unused year-end monies that you, I guess, have to give back, or may maybe you can explain exactly how much and what goes on with these unused funds. Well, um, Whenever, if they're, or the reappropriated dollars. Right. Uh, from my understanding from the Bureau of Senior Services, it's the best of my knowledge that whenever at the end of the fiscal year, um, you know, if they haven't spent all that money, uh, it, they don't have the ability to reallocate it after that. They, do, they give it out in grant awards throughout the year, but then if, it's, if one county can't spend it, uh, then it's you know, left unspent, and they say they don't have the authority to reallocate it. So, like last year, my understanding from the uh, commissioner it was 1.5 million was was left unspent, and I don't know what this fiscal year was. And you said that's been an annual trend. Of it, it has having... been a trend that there's been amounts. Uh, what the amounts is each year, I'm not sure, but there there is amounts that has uh, has been left over. Okay, thank you. Maybe we could uh, have a little history on that as well, uh, especially as we're running into. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, you know, growing needs of our senior services, uh, and we saw that on the film here, and I think each of us hear that in our backyard. So uh, maybe a future request, Mr. Chairman, but thank you. Uh, oh, I think that's very reasonable. I, in full disclosure, I do sit on the board of a uh, senior citizen center. So I've, uh, for our particular center, I know all too well the financial stresses that we're under. So. Of, um, 
I think we do need to full disclosure of some of the finances. Uh, Delegate Combs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so you're part of your state employee, correct? No. Okay, so who are you employed by? I, I am employed by the Council on Aging and All Care Home and Community Services. Um, like I talked about throughout the, the, uh, the presentation, uh, senior uh, center providers are uh, local nonprofit organizations. Uh, we receive state and federal grants, uh, but the large portion of our money comes from fee-for-service uh, transactions and other private funding. Uh, because we, our goal is to try and meet the, the state and federal dollars don't exactly cover all the services we need to provide. So we reach out to other avenues and, and uh, provide services that way too. So what percentage of your budget is state provided? Um, my agency is about 17% that's a federal and state combination. So it's 34%? 17%. 17% each no, or together? Total. For state and federal. So where does the other 73% come from? Just grants or? Uh, no, it's not grant based. It's fee for service transactions. Okay. So on the, sorry, um, on the fee for service transactions, is that income based or not? No, a lot of it comes from uh, agent disabled waiver program, personal care program, traumatic brain injury. We have insurance contracts with like Humana, the VA, um, and we have some private pay individuals who just pay us directly for services. So um, for all of the services, including like the Meals on Wheels and stuff, is are those services income-based? Uh, no, Meals is uh, it's not income-based. There's a long list of requirements for eligibility. Uh, you have to be over the age of 60, and then if you're uh, homebound, you might be eligible for the home-delivered meals. Uh, we request donations. And if uh, people want to donate, they can. Any donations that comes in uh, gets to produce more meals. But there's no, uh, no income based on that. So some, there could be somebody out there making a million dollars a year in investment retirement income, and they're eligible for this program the same as anybody else is. Is that true? Uh, that's true. If they're over age of 60, they would be eligible. Uh, we have a sliding fee donation. So we, we give them a sheet when we sign up. It's like, you know, if your income is this much, you know, we, we would request that you pay, like our agency is $6. If, if, you know, if they have the income abilities, we request that they would give a donation each day of $6 to cover the meal. So then when you pay these providers, is the smallest um, unit that I guess at the state level or at your level manages it is the county? So it's like contracted out by county or is it, are there districts or how is that done? Uh, most of them are done by counties. Uh, some of the counties cover more than one county. Some of the agencies, I'm sorry, cover more than one county. Uh, like, like I said, my agency, Council on Aging, is a little different. We manage the senior centers in Wyoming County, but then we, uh, we have uh, services that we provide in home care, some other things in about 14 different counties. Are there, what, um, if any, uh, procedures or policies does the state or your group have do you encourage multiple providers in every county or every area that's being served by someone? Uh, depends on the program because with the Older Americans Act, uh, that is regulated based on the, the uh, county. Those funds go to a specific county. So only one person can provide home delivered meals through Older Americans Act funding in that county. Um, so when you give this, send this money to these nonprofits, um, what mechanisms do you have that is ensuring the money is being spent? Um, my grandma, as, you know, was a cook at one of these centers for like 20 years, and she learned that you know the director that was like really really old, like oh, maybe 90, and the accountant were making six figures a year, but they were struggling to pay for you know the food. Um, what mechanisms do you have in place that provides transparency and accountability for these nonprofits that you, that we're providing the money to? Uh, well, I don't um, provide the money to people. My agency is one of the agencies that receive fundings. Uh, but the transparency, uh, all of the nonprofit agencies are audited every year by outside auditing firm. Uh, all of the agencies that give the grants, they come in at least once a year, sometimes more, and audit the, uh, the payments. And then also, uh, now, whenever you send in a request monthly to get reimbursed for whatever your expenses were, you send your invoices for that month, too, with a, a detail that goes through the state auditor's office for review before that they'll uh, process the payment for those funds. And does that include wages for the executives of the nonprofits? Uh, the, wa the wages for the executives for the nonprofit agencies, if it's money that is used for the grants, 
uh, then yes, it would be listed on those requests for the cash request. All right. Um, anything you can do to encourage transparency in where the money is actually going, whether it's going to um, bureaucrats or food for seniors, anything we can do to provide transparency to that, I think is um, highly needed. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Senator Clements. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jennifer, thank you for being here on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, your agencies depend mostly on volunteer or paid employees. Mostly paid employees. Um, we don't have a whole lot of volunteers. Our board members are all volunteers. Um, and then there are some uh, volunteers that's in the senior center. But as far as delivering meals, um, there's very few counties who have many people that volunteer to deliver meals, which is, is different than a lot of states. A lot of states, they have people who donate their lunch times and things like that to deliver meals. But I think one thing here in West Virginia that keeps people from volunteering for things like that is the time, because it's like if we have a meal route in West Virginia, it's like we can't just go deliver meals and, you know, half an hour and be back. It's like, no, it's like it's a, you know, a six hour event to, to deliver meals to a section of the county. Well, do you find it a challenge to keep employees? Yes, very challenged, especially right now. Um, not necessarily to keep employees, but to retain new employees to cover the need that we've experienced the last few years. Um, it's, you know, and it's, you know, I'm sure it's the same as everywhere else you go. People say, well, I don't have enough people to work. And uh, we've ex experienced the same thing. And um, so, you know, we've raised our wages and uh, tried to, you know, ex have bonus, sign on bonuses and things like that as, as some of the for-profit agencies can do and uh, to try and retain people. But it's still challenging. It's, you know, our, our job, as you, you, know, you saw in there, it's, it's uh, not a glamorous job that, you know, our employees have, but it's a very important job. And um, so we're, we're in desperate need of, of some caring, caring, passionate people. I know, uh, I'm <clears throat> living in a small town, I know that it's a challenge to find in-home people to offer in-home care. And is that a challenge throughout the state or is that just something locally? No, faced? it's a challenge throughout the whole state. Is it people just don't want to do it? Uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert on the workforce, but um, our, our challenge that we came across, we, uh, I'll just use our example here lately, trying to hire some in-home people. We use uh, Indeed.com a lot for posting, and then we post stuff you know, in the newspapers and different things. And we'll get a lot of applicants who will, who will uh, you know, apply on Indeed at different places, and we'll call them to come in for an interview. But then when we call them, uh, they're like, we're sorry, we can't come in. It's like, but you just applied, you know, sometimes it'll be just that morning and they'll be like, well, we're applying because, you know, we had to apply for unemployment and they have to, says we have to apply for so many jobs, so we did, but, you know, they're not really interested in necessarily coming in for an interview or working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Delegate Boggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jennifer, thank you for being here. I appreciate your presentation. And as I understand it, you're kind of here wearing two hats, correct? Yes. I mean, with Wyoming County area and then as well as the uh, president of the association. Yes. Do, do all of the county senior centers belong to the association? I know probably most do. Most of them. I think we only have four counties that's not a member right now. I, that's the best of my, my, my knowledge. I think there's four that's not. I, I know it's small and it's one that's had me concerned for a long time. But um, one thing that and I want to ask your, your a question about something. Regardless of, regardless of income, we know that seniors uh, are faced with a lot of challenges and some of the things that you mentioned in your presentation earlier about regardless of income we have seniors that their families have left and they really have maybe no immediate family or a strong informal support network to be an, to be an advocate for them uh, are you finding that uh, that's something that that there are maybe services that are available and the word is just not getting out because they, a lot of folks just don't either technology-wise know how to apply, they don't know what's available to ask for, or maybe that no one's sharing with them what is available for them. Do you see that as an issue? We, we do see that as an issue. Um, but at, at some point, it's, we, we've talked about different you know, campaigns and letting people know more about the service. But at the same time, we're struggling to try and serve the people that we have now, 
So that's the dilemma. It's like, you know, do it's we, we'd love to help more people, but at the same time we're limited on the number of people we can help. Obviously this all comes back to, to, to budget situations, I think, eventually. But you touched on the uh, uh, the shortage of uh, workers. Right. And I know I'm on the board of an in-home care agency, and I know that that is an issue. And I know that my parents are elderly and uh, have health issues. And I know just trying to find someone to come in to help with them is is a, is is a daunting task even if you live in an area and you know know everyone it still doesn't make it any easier to find that so um, from your member agencies what are the what are the biggest challenges is is it budget is it is it uh, workers is it the ability that the the pay is not enough to pay the workers uh, and I obviously have some concerns about needing to uh, maintain and expand the meals that we've put out since the pandemic because I have a big concern that folks have become dependent on those and they may go away at some point if we don't uh, step up to the plate. Right, you're absolutely correct. And it's, it's a combination, I, I would say, of you know, three major items is, is what I think it, it, it would, you know, I guess hinders us the most is of course, one, you talk about the budget of those programs, and two, the staff, and then three is sometimes uh, not being able to have the flexibility that we need whenever we do get some federal or state grants, because as I talked about several times, each county is unique in the way it needs to provide services, and so there needs to be a little bit more flexibility on you know whether they can uh, they can spend more money in this county on meals or they can spend more money you know on transportation or you know or if this county may need to before they can provide more meals they need to maybe need to spend some of that money on uh, you know replacing a freezer or you know a refrigerator or purchasing you know one of the hot cold trucks like you saw in our our uh, videos the hot cold trucks you know were were a blessing when we got those it was like it really helped us to deliver better quality hot meals to our seniors across the state and. Um, that, that's been a challenge to, to keep those up and going and getting those replaced too. Well, I had one final question, but I think you just answered it. The flexibility to be able to look at the needs because we have 55 different counties and we have not only every county's needs are different uh, for healthcare, transportation, food access, a number of different things, but also um, we have, even within counties, we have vast differences between uh, one area of an, a county, you go 20 miles, and, and it's it's like you know a different world. So uh, it's it sounds like that you really need the ability to have some flexibility with how the funds are spent based on your specific needs. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, Delegate, for your questions. Uh, next, Delegate Doyle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one. Uh, to follow up on Delegate Boggs on the counties that are and are not members of the association. You said you thought there were four that were not. Can you, off the top of your head, remember which four they are? No. I'm just curious. I'm thinking of, no. I, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, well, if you could we, get us we, that information. Uh, we've added so many, but we'll, I'll, I can look at the list and tell Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate uh, Hess Cross. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for being here today, Jennifer. Um, I do have a question. You said to keep up with current services, you need a five to six million for the coming year. What all is that increase? It, I'm sure it's food, gas, but what else is the increase in the amount covering? Um, the five to six million dollar came from uh, Commissioner Roswell when he was at our spring conference, saying that that would be the cost of the uh, current level of meals that we serve. And that reimbursement does cover um, whatever, you know, food, gas, utilities, uh, drivers, wages, things like that. But we've grown with COVID, and uh, uh, Delegate Boggs touched on it a little bit. It's like well, during the COVID, we uh, increased our meals such a large amount that now that people that weren't aware of it before, you know, have, have came and have gotten it, and we were able to provide those meals. But once that COVID funding goes away, um, that's where that lack of you know five or six million dollars is going to come in there, and we have to have to figure out how we're going to handle that that change 
And uh, that's one thing with this uh, project we're working on with WVU is hopefully we can maybe figure out some different ways of delivering meals or, you know, what services people need and, and how we can maybe take on that challenge. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Next, uh, Delegate Tully. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned there's a waiting list for services in various counties. Can you give me a ballpark on what the waiting list, um, how long someone goes on the list, how long they wait for services? I'm sure it's county dependent, but right. could you even give me an estimate? Um, it, that was, I think it was in the video that uh, the, the driver had talked about that. At that point, there was a waiting list that she was referring to for meals. Mm -hmm. um, but with the COVID pandemic and the extra funding received, there's, uh, we've been able to serve most people that that's, uh, you know, came to our doors. Um, the uh, waiting list uh, for the other programs, I'm not sure uh, statewide, but there's, I know there's waiting lists for uh, Lighthouse and Fair, and, um, and some of those right now is, is again, is a combination between uh, funding needs and uh, worker needs. Employees. Lack of employees. Um, and the work, like in the video, they meant, and you've mentioned also the importance of taking the patients to medical treatment. Um, and sometimes those trips are very long. In Dr. Deskin's assessment, have you asked to look at any telehealth options for those individuals to see if there could be some access to some of the specialists via telehealth? You know, do those seniors have broadband access? Um, is there, do we need to get somebody out there with technology that could help them do some of the telehealth visits to make it a little bit more efficient? Because it may save, number one, your worker a lot of time and then also a lot of cost to your programs. Right, yeah. Oh, I agree with you 100%. Um, uh, we are still in the development stage of the, the surveys, uh, but that's something that we could definitely include with discussion about broadband. I think it would, you know, especially for access, like I said, to the telehealth services, because if you don't have to take someone maybe to the cardiologist, they, if they just need a check, like a simple checkup and assessment, okay, they're doing well on their meds, they may not need a two hour trip to Charleston. So oh. it, it would be very much more efficient, I think, for the program and probably much more uh, conducive to a sense of normalcy for the patient not to be right. drug out yeah. of their home and on the road. Um, you mentioned that certain counties, sometimes they would have funds that uh, remained unallocated and those funds would end up going back, um, I guess, to the Bureau. You, is there one partic any particular counties that seem to have more trouble with that or is it all of them or is it some of the grant process? Where is the breakdown in that? Because I couldn't imagine you get some funding that's allocated and not being able to spend it. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't know those amounts. I begin to question for the Bureau of Senior Services. But, um, you know, a lot of it has to do, again, with not having the flexibility to spend it different ways. Um, because, you know, once you get that, there's some restrictions on, you know, how you have to spend it and how you have to use it. And uh, workers sometimes, and employees, like if it was just for Lighthouse, uh, if they didn't have the staff to provide the services, then they've been able, they've been able to do that. And, you know, if you have the staff maybe in another county and, you know, you have a waiting list in that other county and County A doesn't have the staff, but they have the funds and County B doesn't have the funds, but they have the staff. I just kind of wonder if there's some way that we could work that out to try to figure out how to make sure that everybody's getting and their needs met. Right. And that's what we hope the goal is that, you know, we'd like for that money to stay with the senior program so that it can get spent in whichever county or whichever area, um, you know, that needs to be spent. And we're going to talk about urban versus rural. I mean, is there any adjustment in the level of funding the senior centers receive based upon whether they are in, say, an urban, like a more urban county like Kanawha County versus Wyoming County or Nicholas County or somewhere? Right. Um, the federal funds is and the, the state funds have been allocated this new year based on a new funding formula that the Older Americans Act uh, did with the Bureau of Senior Services. And uh, my understanding is they did take that into consideration. However, uh, the region that I am in is Region 4, and it covers pretty much the sort of southeastern part of the state. It covers Wyoming, Mercer, McDowell, um, Greenbrier, Summers, Monroe, up through Pocahontas. And um, our agency, unfortunately, had a decrease of about thirty-some thousand dollars based on that new formula. And like I said, my understanding is that they did take that into account, but I, I question with, especially having Pocahontas County in our region, how how we could lose such large funds. I know that they talked about a hold harmless bottom line that was in there from before. 
um, but that have, losing thirty some thousand dollars to our agency is is a huge cut. And those are, you know, like you said, mentioned Pocahontas. That's a very large rural county. I mean, I couldn't imagine. I'm curious about that funding formula because I think maybe there needs to be some adjustments. It kind of seems like there should be some other adjustments that are made to that because it doesn't seem quite correct that that would you would lose money on that. Right. Even if it's a federal uh, formula. Uh, I had questioned whether they, you know, could possibly use it for the federal form and not necessarily use it for the state funds because, you know, if it's state funds, I would think, you know, the legislature would have the ability to choose how it would be allocated. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Tell you free. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Brown. I want to just uh, tell you that I appreciate what you do for these seniors. I uh, just recently I've had my, my um, father uh, has been put into a memory home care. So I've been wandering the halls of these long term care facilities a lot more than I ever was before. So I get a really good look at what goes on. Um, I just had one thought about the, uh, the unemployment issue that you guys are having down there that the people are because I have a I have that same problem myself and it seems to be a, something new where these people will apply for the job set up the uh, appointment and then just never show up it happens over and over and over again do you think if um, if uh, the unemployment had to contact you to find out whether or not uh, the person showed up for the interview and that if the job was still open, do you think that might help with the, this issue that keeps reoccurring? I would think it would. So do I. Thank you so much. Well, any other questions of our presenter? None being seen, I do have one short question, and you may not have this data, but we've talked a lot about the difficulty in hiring and retaining people. And statewide, or even in your particular agency, do you have any idea how many direct care provider spots are unfilled right now? Uh, statewide, no. Um, in my agency in particular, we would like to hire about 25 to 30 people. Like right now, we could use that many. Hmm. And you just not getting the applicants to fill the spots? No. And in your discussions with your member counties you, you take that to be a um, statewide problem yes yeah okay any other questions of our presenter none being seen we do thank you for your informative uh presentation and uh, i think i'll speak on behalf of the committee that uh, this is one of the more important issues that this legislature deals with is the uh, care of our senior citizens uh, I've certainly committed eight years to that, and I know Delegate Boggs, you've committed a lot more, and Senator Boley and, and everybody here. So uh, again, we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, and your agency and your association because uh, I heard, uh, as Senator Nelson raised, uh, I heard a number of um, concerns here about the need for some more funding, and uh, I'm committed to seeing it through this next legislature. So well, thank you so much. We, I appreciate your time today. We appreciate your time. Uh, that being said, is there any other business to come